ss8h5.b. We're going to split this video or this element into two different videos. The first video, we're going to look at Georgia's role. Not the Civil War in general, but Georgia's role in the Civil War, specifically including the Union blockade of the Georgia coast and the Emancipation Proclamation in the beginning part of us, our video here today. The next part will include everything else, which is Chickamauga, Sherman's Atlanta campaign, Sherman's march to the sea, and then ending with Andersonville. So let's get started with how, who, what, where, when, why, how, and because Civil War. So where did it start? It's not in our standards, but we're going to throw this information to you so you can understand how it really first got started. It was at Fort Sumter in South Carolina. You can remember from our previous video that South Carolina was the first state to leave the United States. Uh, well, at that time, the Northern troops, the Union troops, pretty much had control of Fort Sumter in South Carolina. South Carolina did not like that because they left the United States and now the United States, the Union troops are actually in control of their fort. That's a problem. So the Confederates fire the first shots of the Civil War. Now, also, if you remember back to the American Revolution where we're like the shot heard around the world, we're not really sure who fired the first shot of the American Revolution. Was it the Patriots or the British? Nobody knows, but we do know who, who fired the first shot uh, uh, the Civil War at Fort Sumter. It was the Confederates. And they kept shooting, and the North kept shooting back for 34 straight hours. That's pretty specific, but 34 straight hours. Uh, the North controlled the fort until they didn't when they surrendered the fort to the Confederate soldiers. Uh, the Confederates obviously considered this a small little battle victory, uh, which it was. And then when word got back to President Lincoln that the Southern troops, the Confederate troops, took their fort back at Fort Sumter. President Lincoln, at the time, was pretty angry. So angry that he said, I need 75,000 volunteers to sign up to fight, uh, to show the Confederate soldiers we mean business. I'm going to need you to volunteer. Remember, volunteers like not paid. I need you to volunteer for, oh, I don't know, three months, 90 days, and then the Confederates... We'll stop fighting. They'll come back to the United States, see that they're wrong. Everything will be fine. President Lincoln was just a little bit off with the number of people he needed and the total amount of time he needed them for. Because after that, four more states then seceded from the United States, Tennessee, North Carolina, Arkansas, and Virginia. All of the states said, okay, uh, it's time to go. This is going to actually happen. We're leaving the United States. We're going to start the Confederate States of America. Once Virginia left, we talked about this before in the other video, or video, uh, the Confederate States of America said, hey, let's move our capital from Alabama to Virginia. And then Richmond became the capital of the Confederacy. And then the war begins. Okay. The Union blockade of Georgia's coast. Basically, Georgia has an ocean that shares its borders with Florida, Alabama, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Tennessee. Lincoln wanted to cut off the Confederacy from Great Britain. The easiest way to do that is to get in the way of Great Britain and the South. And really the only way to do that is to get in the ocean, use your boats, and make a little net or wall or blockade inside the ocean. Now, if you've ever been to the ocean, you can see that it's pretty big, large, wide, deep. Uh, it's going to be a problem to be able to effectively block uh, the coastline of Georgia. However, that was the plan that the Union troops came up with, specifically General Winfield Scott, who's in charge. He comes up with a plan to block the Georgia coast, and not just Georgia, but pretty much the southern coast, the southern state's coast. And he calls it the Anaconda Plan. No, not the Nicki Minaj song, not the Sir Mix-a-Lot song. It's an anaconda plan, which basically squeeze, he wants to squeeze the life out of the Confederacy. So basically he's saying, hey, since we want to squeeze the life out of the Confederacy, and we're calling it the anaconda plan because of that. So what does an anaconda do? Well, it's a big snake and it squeezes its prey. We, we have a video in here of it, but obviously you can go to the website, exceedthestandard.com to find it. Uh, we're not going to show the video in this video, 
but basically an anaconda squeezes its prey until it suffocates and dies. Then the anaconda takes its time and swallows the prey, the animal, whole. It's impressive. Um, it's not a way to go. Uh, but the anaconda does its job, and it's got basically says, we're going to do the same job as the anaconda. We're going to squeeze the life out of the Confederacy and then hopefully not swallow it whole because that'd be gross. But the plan was to block any boats going to or leaving from the southern ports in the southern states. They wanted to block all the ports. It's really hard to block the entire ocean, but we know where the ports are. So at least the northern troops believed they knew where all the ports were and they could block them. The problem is the southern troops, the Confederates, had a plan. First, the north, you know they have a strong navy. The south has strong cotton trade with England and France and other countries as well. And the north's like, okay, if we can't stop the cotton, maybe we can stop, or slavery, maybe we can stop this cotton trading, which would then stop slavery. If we can't, if the South can't make money from the cotton, then let's maybe stop the trading of cotton and we'll end the war. That'll work, right? Not so much. England and France right now can't send South needed guns and weapons. So we are, the North is blocking the Southern states from being able to transport goods and export and import stuff to help them with the war. But it really didn't effectively stop uh, the boats leaving the ports. It wasn't successful. Nine, if you fail nine out of 10 times, you're not doing a good job, okay? So the North, although they have the boats at the ports, they failed nine out of 10 times that a boat would go by, nine out of 10 boats would get through. So basically these were private citizens who are taking really the risk of testing the Union blockade to see how good the blockade was. It turned out the Union blockade wasn't that good. They had smaller, faster boats. They went through at nighttime. They were able to get past it. It wasn't a big deal. It really wasn't. The anaconda wasn't really awake and looking for prey to strangle. So the southern boats were able to get through. Then things start to change. Fort Pulaski is attacked by the north. The north is like, okay, you took Fort Sumter. We're going to take Fort Pulaski. The thinking is, because here's Fort Pulaski here, the Savannah River, Fort Pulaski is in the middle of the Savannah River and the Atlantic Ocean. So if there's any boats that want to go through the Savannah River, basically get into the middle of South Carolina and Georgia, they're going to have to go past Fort Pulaski. Whoever controls Fort Pulaski here is going to control the gateway into the Savannah River or exiting the Savannah River. So if you have Fort Pulaski, you have control of the Savannah River. The North wanted control of the Savannah River, so they attacked Fort Pulaski a lot. Okay, The blockade is currently hurting Georgia. Georgia can't fight the Northern Navy. Nothing's coming into the Savannah, the city of Savannah. It's not really going well. So the North does get Fort Pulaski. They are in charge of the fort here. After they attack, the Confederates uh, surrender the fort to the Northern troops, the Union troops. And now the North is in control of this fort, Pulaski, which means the North now controls pretty much the Savannah River or entrance to it from the ocean. Question, what was the Union blockade of Georgia's coast meant to do? Stop illegal immigration? Nope. Blo <laughs> bloke. Block boats from coming or going? Yes. They wanted to stop boats from leaving the ports in the southern ports. Uh, it didn't really work out that well, but it was meant to do that. They wanted to, the Union wanted to stop the southern boats from leaving. What did General Scott want to do or say? He wanted to see, squeeze the life out of the Confederacy. He did not say, when life gives you lemons, squeeze the lemon juice in your enemy's eyes, although that would be hurting a little bit here and there. He did not want to stop the South, collaborate with them, and then just listen. That was vanilla ice. He did not want to challenge them to a duel. So General Scott, he wanted to squeeze the life out of the Confederacy, which is why he called it the Anaconda Plan, which then we go now to 
the Emancipation Proclamation. So, the Emancipation Proclamation, it's important to know, was a document, not a speech, a document written by Abraham Lincoln. He wrote it after the Battle of Antietam. Now, we used to teach this a little bit more in depth, but Antietam kind of looks like Vietnam. Vietnam spelled kind of like Antietam. It was, Vietnam was a really bad war. It didn't end well. Many, 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 many people died. Same thing with the Battle of Antietam. It was so bad that President Lincoln wrote the Emancipation Proclamation just after the Battle of Antietam. People think the Emancipation Proclamation is all about freeing slaves. That is actually incorrect. Kind of. The document is incorrectly described as that, and we're going to get a little bit into it now. What the document actually says, the proclamation says, all slaves in the rebellious states, not everywhere, all slaves in the rebellious states would be freed on January 1st, 1863, if the southern states did not come back and join the Union. If the Confederate states came back and joined the Union before January 1st, 1863, they could keep their slaves. Abraham Lincoln was actually going to let them keep their slaves. But at the same time, he was pretty sure that the Confederate soldiers and the states, the Confederate States of America, were not actually going to take him up on his offer. Uh, but at least he offered it up. That's going to come into play a little bit later when we get to the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. But basically, he was just saying, hey, if you don't come back, I'm going to free all the slaves uh, the first of the year of 1863. But just in the Confederate states, not everywhere. If you were a slave in a Union state, in the Northern states, you were not going to be freed. Now, this is where it gets interesting. If you're President Lincoln, you're president in the North, you're, you're from the state of Illinois, and supposedly you're against slavery. So much so, states actually leave the United States to start their own states, their own country. Um, why wouldn't you just end slavery in your home state or in any other northern state. President Lincoln did not do that. He actually, in the Emancipation Proclamation, didn't even give that as an opportunity for any of the northern states. It was just to end slavery in the southern states. Again, if the South surrendered before that day, January 1st, 1863, they were going to be allowed to keep their slaves. But here's the thing. They were going to be able to keep their slaves anyways, because they were no longer in the United States. That's like saying your friend's parents are telling you what to do. You don't, I mean, you kind of have to listen because they're adults, but who's your real parent? It's, it's whoever you're living with. So the thing is, the South didn't have to listen to President Lincoln because he, President Lincoln, wasn't the South's president. The South's president was Jefferson Davis. So why would they listen to the president they left about slavery when now he's saying I can keep my slaves that no, the Southern States don't trust president Lincoln. They don't trust him at all. They're going to stay in the Confederate States of America country. And we're just going to continue this war. Sorry. It's just, we're not getting back together. Even though the president gave him an ultimatum, um, he, the Southern States said, yeah, we're calling this. No, we're staying, we're fighting. We want to keep the way we are going the way we are going. So nope. We're done. So Lincoln, knowing this, he basically was trying to say, hey, if you don't come back, we're going to free your slaves. But if you do come back, you can keep them. He knows they're not going to come back. I mean, he pretty much knew this without any uncertainty whatsoever. But this document also allowed all of the world to understand this is a northern southern thing. This is like a family thing. Stay out of our war. This is a civil war. We don't want your help. Nobody wants to come in and help. Stop it. Leave us alone. We'll take care of it. This is our issue. We'll figure it out. So the Emancipation Proclamation kind of keeps European powers out of our conflict. It keeps them out of the South, helping the South fight the North and the Northern troops also as well, keeps other countries helping them as well. So it's a North versus South thing. And it's about to get a little bit messy. So question about the Emancipation Proclamation, who wrote it? Well, remember the Emancipation Proclamation was a presidential proclamation 
Our president at the time in the North was President Lincoln. President Jefferson, Jefferson Davis, was from the Confederates. Justin Bieber, no, please. Justin Bieber is never the answer. Who was to be freed from the Emancipation Proclamation? All the slaves? Nope. None of the slaves? Nope. The Southern slaves were to be freed. That's it, not the Northern slaves. And that's only if the Southern states, all of them, came back to the United States. That wasn't gonna happen anyways. That's our video for today. Uh, that was GSE SS8H5.B, the first part at least. Thank you for watching. Again, if you want more information about Georgia Studies, go to exceedthestandard.com and check it out. And with that, peace out.